All right, so I have a question for you guys, and this is a serious question, and I know that we're in church, and so it's tempting to just sit there and let me talk at you, but I want you to really consider this and actually answer me when I ask you this question. You ready? Have you ever received a gift that you knew was a re-gift? Yes. You have? Yes. Okay. And so that was awkward, right? Yeah. No? It wasn't awkward? Did you just call them on it? Like, dude, you didn't want this. No? All right. You, you re-gifted it to somebody else. Oh, my goodness. Confessions. <laughs> well played, sir. That's good. <laughs> yeah, everybody here has gotten a re-gift. Have you guys ever gotten a re-gift? No? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So you, you knew the person, they, they didn't want it, and they didn't care enough to think through what to get you, right? We kind of both knew that, and it was kind of like this standoff, right? Like, you know it, they know it, they're trying to hide it, like they hope you don't know it, but let's be honest, nobody in the history of ever has been given a re-gift that they didn't know was a re-gift, right? You know, oh, you thought I liked this, I really but I don't. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right? Or, wait, those clothes aren't my size. <laughs> oh, man, I lost the receipt, <laughs> right? But, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it, actually, it actually probably hurt a little bit more to get that gift than if they just said, hey, I forgot to get you something, right? Because now, now you're kind of like pulling the wool over my eyes. And try, no, you didn't feel that way? No? How'd it make you feel? I think it's just nice that they even thought of you in the first place. So well, so what, if it was your birthday, they thought of you, right? Yeah. So okay. Could give you a or a gift, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, you're very low maintenance, and remind me to uh, send all the gifts I don't like <laughs> your way. <laughs> no fruitcake. Fruitcake's delicious. Don't, don't be hating on fruitcake. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. Here's... Here's, here's an important point for us to understand about these gifts, right? Is the gift itself matters significantly less than the gift giver and the heart behind it, Amen. right? So we're, we're willing to, to kind of take those things and, and bear with it, right? Based on who the person is that's giving it to us, right? It, it matters more to us the feeling, as you just articulated, that they even thought of me more important than what the gift itself actually is, right? Well, Paul is going to illustrate this exact point among others this morning as we continue in our series through 1 Corinthians. So this morning, we are going to be reading through a chapter um, that I know you're all familiar with. Now, if you've grown up in church or not grown up in church, if this is your first time ever stepping foot in a church, you've still heard this passage of scripture. They might not have put 1 Corinthians 13 and told you where it was after that, but, but you've heard this at weddings, you've heard this quoted in pop culture, in television, in movies, right? It is one of the most famous passages in all of scripture. And I wanna make sure that just because we're familiar with something, that we're not too familiar with it. I wanna make sure even though we're familiar with something, that we're not too familiar with it, that it loses its essence, that it loses its value, that we just gloss over it and forget how important it really, really is, and that we place it inside of its proper context, right? We talked about this a ton of times, how important context is. Nobody likes being taken out of context. Nobody. If we're having a conversation and you just quote a small snippet of what I said and use it as a weapon against somebody else, you've taken me out of context, right? You're actually quoting me. I did, in fact, use those couple of exact words, but now you just took them and used them for a completely different purpose than what was being illustrated, right? That's being taken out of context. You don't like it. I don't like it. God doesn't like it either. So let's look at this passage of Scripture in the context. We've been going through the gifts. Paul has been correcting the church at Corinth for using the gifts the wrong way. They've been using the gifts as a way of creating a hierarchy or a caste system in the church. Here's the more spiritual. Here's the less spiritual. There's divisions. There's debates. There's arguments. They're not getting along. There's issues. Right? And then Paul is saying, no, no, no. Everybody's been given a gift. Last week we covered that everybody's part of one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. The hand can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. We're all in this thing together. 
But then, as he says, we're all in this together. We're all unified. We're all one church. We're one body coming together as one. Then he says, after saying all the gifts are the same, right? The eye and the ear and the mouth, we're all the same. We're all part of one body. We're all of the same value. Then he says, but I want you to seek the greater gifts. And we're like, wait a second, Paul, you contradicting yourself? No, Paul was using a play on words to say, The greater gifts are not gifts that the church has been given to use, but gifts that all of us have received as Christians, as followers of Jesus, gifts from God. And that is his introduction as we flow into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes, If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, everything I own, and if I give over my body, everything I am, in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Wow. Powerful words. See, those are powerful words when you just read them on somebody's t-shirt or you hear it at at a wedding or whatever. Those are powerful words just even taken out of context. But let's consider, again, what Paul was just saying to the church. This is a letter of correction. Right? And we hear this in a loving tone, like at a wedding, and it's so sweet, and you know, the pastor or priest stands up there in his suit or tuxedo all proper, or his robe, right? and we've got this formal, oh, if I speak human or angelic tongues, it too. No, no, Paul's, Paul's like, guys, hey guys, <laughs> hello, look, if I speak in human tongues, angelic tongues, I don't care, you're lacking love. Hey, 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 listen, listen. I don't care. I don't care if, if you got the gift of prophecy. I don't care if you got the whole freaking Bible memorized. I don't care. If you don't have love, you got nothing. I don't care. I don't care, guys. If you take everything you own and everything you are and you live your life as a volunteer and you sell it all and you live impoverished and you give everything away to the poor and hungry, but you don't do it out of love, if you don't have love, you, my friend, are spiritually bankrupt. You've got nothing. That's the context. That's what Paul is saying here. What good is the gift or the gifts that we have been given by God to build up the church and reach lost people if we don't have the key motivation behind doing it? Love. Love. It's got to be love. Love has got to be that driving force behind everything you are, every decision you make, everything you do. Because it'll change not just the way you see people, but the way that you handle people. If we use our gifts without love, then perhaps there's another reason we're doing it. Maybe we're doing it out of selfish ambition or a desire to acquire power and authority to exploit people and manipulate them. Which unfortunately, my friends, happens way more in church world than it should. It breaks my heart the amount of people that have been impacted by church hurt that have been exploited and manipulated by supposed Christian leaders in the church. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Truth is you deserve better than that. Truth is that is not godly. And the truth is not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is in fact a follower or a leader in Christ church. Listen, the IRS may consider them a church. Their constitution and bylaws may consider them a church. But if that leader is leading out of selfish ambition and manipulation and control rather than love and brokenness and a desire for people to be changed rather than for self-promotion, that, my friends, is not a church. If love is not the motivation behind why we do what we do, then no matter how much you speak in tongues, it doesn't matter. No matter how often the gift of prophecy flows through you, it doesn't matter. 
You can have the entire Bible memorized in its proper context, but if you do not wield it with love, it is a weapon. You can give away all your possessions to the poor, but if it is not in love, it is nothing. So let me ask you a question then. Why on earth would someone give all of their possessions to the poor except out of pure love? Well, I could think of two reasons. Religious obligation or power and a sense of being greater than someone else. Now, both of these things are connected. But before we judge someone else's heart, let's ask this question to ourselves, shall we? Let's ask this question to ourselves. Let me be really clear. If, if you looked at the story of Saul in the book of 1 Samuel, he's not somebody who, who started off even pursuing power. They chose him. Paul wasn't nominating. Paul wasn't saying, I'm sorry, Saul. Saul wasn't saying vote for Saul, <laughs> right? So Saul was somebody who was, was chosen by the people, right? So this guy was like just some humble guy who happened to look the part. And he started off great with the best of intentions. See, but the power got to him. Something happened. And here's how we know the power got to him. Because when this kid David showed up, that God had sent to be the next king, instead of embracing him and mentoring him and training him, he threw spears at him. Tried to have him killed so that the kingdom would go to his son Jonathan rather than to this kid David who the prophet Samuel told him, Saul, God is done with you. He has chosen David to replace you as king. What is my motivation? We may start out right. Many of us who grew up in church probably, you know, at first were forced by mom or dad, right? And then eventually our faith became our own. And then came that moment where we said, you know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Right? We used to hang on. We used to hang on Joshua too, right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right? We used to hang on that when we were kids. And then, and then it came to the point where we said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. It's that moment where it became, it became mine. And that was great. That was a great moment, Right? But then maybe life happens and things happen and we fall off and there's confusion and there's heartache and, and maybe, maybe we were told some lies in church, right? Maybe we, were, maybe we were experiencing the whole, well, you know, Jesus loves you and if you trust him, everything's going to work out. And our idea of everything working out means, oh, I'm not going to have hardship and I'm not going to have struggle. Listen, let me, let me be really clear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they still had to go into the fire. Jesus just went in with them, Amen. right? They still had to go into the fire. Jesus just went in with them, right? When, when he said, I'll never leave you and never forsake you, he wasn't kidding about that. Nowhere in there did he say, it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. No, what he said was, I will never leave you or forsake you, right? If I can give you the modern translation, right? What Jesus is saying to you, his children, is life's going to suck, but I'm with you. Amen. It's going to be really hard. But the one person that's never going to leave you, no matter how hard and ugly and dirty and nasty it gets, everyone else will leave you. Everyone else will betray you. Everyone else will abandon you. Everyone else will curse you. They'll make up lies about you. They'll, they'll ask you the question, what have you done for me lately? It doesn't matter how much of your time, how much of your life you've given to them. They want something out of you. And Jesus says, no, 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 I want you. I don't want something out of you. I want you. In fact, if you knew how wretched and vile you really were in the deep depths of your heart, you wouldn't want you, but I still want you just as you are right there, Amen. right there. You, What's my motivation? Why do I do what I do? Do I have a drive to be more influential? Do I have a sense of religious obligation? Do, do I do my Sunday ritual to feel better? Or am I deeply desirous of gathering with God's people because I love them? What is my motivation?
Why do I do good for others? Have you ever considered these things? Why? We, we call it humanitarian efforts. And, and across the world, we have these organizations with, with people that are trying to separate doing great things for other people from God. And I'm sorry, outside of a true and pure love for God, doing good for others is a selfish motivation. Now let me be really clear. Sometimes that selfish motivation is the feeling of satisfaction that you get from helping other people. It actually releases endorphins, right? It's kind of like we were created and designed to serve others. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Who knew? He did. <laughs> right? But there's, there's selfish motivation there. You know, it's amazing to me how good the churches are at taking care of those who are financially impoverished. It's, it's, it's crazy. I, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm proud of the church. That's, that's really good that the church does that and that they do a really good job with that. But, but I think we miss the point on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Right? Jesus wasn't saying blessed are the financially poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who realize that you are spiritually bankrupt outside of him. And here's the thing. We should take care of the financially poor. I'm not trying to minimize that. But there are middle class and wealthy people that are spiritually bankrupt that need the gospel. Reach them. Go after them. Do you understand? Like we, we need to stop categorizing people. Jesus hung out with the richest of the rich, the poorest of the poor. You know what they had in common? They were spiritually bankrupt. You know what they had in common? They needed Jesus. You know what they had in common? They were broke where it mattered. They were far from God. They were sinners. Like you and like I. Is it because I love Jesus so much that I begin to love what he loves? What is my motivation? This is a great question to consider this morning because I fear we have an entire generation of the church who has lost their focus on what their motivation should be. And this is why they do what they do. And I also fear that this generation has been so deeply impacted by the culture, we have forgotten what it means to love. We've forgotten what it means. We use the word love so flippantly. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love Oreos. I love Disney. I love losing an hour's sleep on a Sunday. That's a lie. But the point is, this, this word love, we use it all over the place. And so, of course, it's easy to twist and manipulate and turn it into whatever we want because contextually, we just keep using it in all these different ways. We don't have a clear definition of what love actually is. See, Paul had this same issue with the church at Corinth. And this is, this is, this is what I love about this series. This is what I love about this. It just goes to continue to show. People don't change. We have the same core foundational needs, core foundational desires from day one. The people in the church at Corinth looked exactly like the people in the church of 2019 United States. Sure, they dressed different, right? They probably didn't, you know, dress as cool as we do, right? They had different clothing, and their language was different. But really, they weren't that different. They had the same issue. Remember, Corinth was the Las Vegas of, of Rome, okay? Right? Remember, we talked about this, okay? It, right, right in the middle of the city, they boasted a temple of a thousand prostitutes, okay? This was like their religious worship was, was you know, free love, okay? Yeah, not that different than our culture, <laughs> all right? Okay, they didn't have television and the internet, but basically what they offered in the middle of the temple, we have for free, all over the place, very easily accessible, right? Okay, so not all that different. And what has happened there and what has happened here is love has been tainted to the point where they didn't even understand the definition of what it was. 
And so Paul, in, in first correcting them and, and saying, hey, if I, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or, or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophecy and understanding and I, and, I, and I don't have love, if I have faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, if I give away everything, including even my body, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Oh my goodness, guys, you don't even know what love is. You don't even know what love is. I need to go deeper. I need to clarify what I mean by this. And here's where he clarifies. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Paul writes, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Is not boastful. Is not arrogant. Is not rude. Is not self-seeking. It's not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. powerful when we consider what love really really is if you're acting in love and you're motivated by love you will find these traits come out naturally did you notice that you 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 can't force this you can't fake this this doesn't mean you've perfected it however there will be clear signs that it is your motivation So how do you know you love someone? Well, you you tend to be more patient with them and even their shortcomings. Right? Anyone relate with that? Yeah. You tend to be more kind, soft-spoken. If something good happens in their life, you, you celebrate with them rather than being jealous of them because you want them to succeed. When you love someone, you don't feel the need to bring them down to bring yourself up. When you love someone, you don't, you don't show off because you feel the need to size them up. When you love someone, you are sensitive to their feelings and you look to bring them up rather than yourself. When you love someone truly, you aren't rude, but sometimes you are. And when you are, you apologize every time. You seek after what's best for them before yourself. You're not annoyed at their very existence or easily irritated by everything they say. And if you find yourself in that situation with someone who you love, where you are easily irritated by everything they say or do, then perhaps what you're doing is the very next thing that Paul talks about. Keeping score. You see, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love isn't keeping score. It isn't keeping a list to explode on you with after, after something else sparks a fire that leads to the tipping point. And this isn't just for husbands and wives either. This goes for every single relationship. Mm-hmm. When you love someone, you find no joy in sin or when they face the consequences either. Mm-hmm. Your heart is broken if you see them going down the wrong path. Maybe you've been hurt and maybe you're sitting there brooding, just waiting for them to get what's coming to them. Well, if that is where you are, then perhaps you do not actually love that person at all. Love rejoices and finds true joy, not just happiness in truth, as it blesses God and rebukes sin in the person's life who you love. Love bears all things. It bears all things. It doesn't keep piling on, but it hits reset often. 
It believes all things. And this doesn't mean that love makes you naive. Let's be really clear. This doesn't mean that love makes you naive, but it means you see and believe the best until you're proven wrong. It means you err on the side of believing that they have the best intentions until you can no longer prove that they actually have the best intentions. So when that day comes that you have to cut off a relationship, you can do it with a clear conscience, knowing you gave your best effort, knowing you really tried your best to believe the best, knowing that there was opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity that you didn't rush to a decision, but that when the, ta- when the time came to end a relationship, you did it the right way. You see, love hopes all things. It has great hopes and big dreams for a future for all whom you love. I have a bright hope for my children's futures and I will lovingly guide them to be who God calls them to be so that they may have a bright future. Love endures all things, even the mess. Love endures all things, even the mess. We need to love in such a way that that love adjusts our expectations. You see, what I expect from my eight-year-old is not what I expect from my four-year-old. I was okay with my newborn's mess until it got to the point where that mess was no longer responsible for their own well-being to continue, which is where we got into potty training. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) Okay? And then accidents happen, but as they learn the ability to do that, now they go to the bathroom perfectly fine, except they peel over the seat, and it's very frustrating. Uh, But besides that, yeah, it's really rough. It's terrible. (laughs) Besides that, they've pretty much got that on lock. Right? Now, it's, it's for them that I did that. Right? Don't get me wrong. I enjoy not buying diapers. That's pretty cool. Right? But I also didn't want to have the only eight-year-old going to school in diapers. Right? There's, there's, there's responsibility and expectation and, and for her sake. So, so she can be a functioning eight-year-old and meet the expectations so that she can go move into this bright future and hope. But it meant that I had to put up with a mess at each stage of the game. What motivates us to do that is love. Amen. God makes those little buggers so cute and adorable because if they weren't, we'd kill them. <laughs> and all the parents said amen. <laughs> okay? I, I want to also briefly point out the progression of these traits here that Paul lists. Patience and kindness go hand in hand. And if I'm not envious of someone, then I don't feel the need to size them up and be boastful or arrogant, right? You see, you see the progression, right? If, if, I, if I was envious and felt the need to be arrogant, it, it also builds inside for me to start being rude to that person because I'm looking out for myself to protect myself, right? Have you noticed that? Like in a, in, a, in a very catty work environment where all the girls are sizing each other up, I've worked in one of those, right? And it's like there's first kind of the, the sizing up and the looks, and then it turns into passive aggressive. And then once, you know, you go out there and why is there a knife sticking out of my tire? Right? <laughs> okay, um, and it, right? So th- it's the whole idea of the, the sizing up and then the rudeness. Why? Well, it all started back. And now being, constantly being in that environment makes you irritable just while being in this person's presence because you keep stacking up more and more reasons why they're terrible and you keep a long list of all your complaints against them and you just can't wait for them to be brought down. Do you see the progression? Do you see it? This was not accidental that Paul wrote it in this order. One builds upon another. Love doesn't even start that process. Love kills it right from day one. And if it it happens, because we're not perfect, we're human, we make mistakes, if it happens where we start making that progression, Paul's like, love keeps no record of wrongs. You better hit that reset button ASAP. I also want to add that these are traits you cannot force. You can't fake it until you make it with love. 
These things are worked in you naturally as you learn to more deeply love. These traits are revealers that you love, not a guide for you to try to conform to. Do you love people like this? Do you love your spouse like this? Take the test. Measure these characteristics against yourself and your interactions. Do you love your children like this? Do you love your parents like this? Do you love your friends like this? Do you love your neighbors like this? Do you love your coworkers like this? Do you love strangers like this? Do you love your enemies like this? See, Jesus continually raised the bar and challenged us all to love our enemies like this. It's crazy. Don't you think those are, those are a bit unrealistic expectations? I mean, that's, that's a high bar. I mean, I would love to love my wife and kids perfectly like this. You want me to love my enemies like this? Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. He writes, love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As, as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. Why? Why will knowledge come to an end? What are you referencing, Paul? Well, he says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. You see, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now, we see only as a reflection, as in a mirror. But then, but then... Face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. See, Paul is saying that the gifts that that he's given us, the gifts of the Spirit that he's given us to equip the church, to build up the church, to go after people, to go in and save the lost, he's saying those gifts are temporary. They are to build up the church here in this time and to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach lost people who are far from God. Paul says prophecies will end. Tongues will cease. The gift of knowledge will come to an end. When we get to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus, there will be no need for these things. Why? Because we will be perfect and complete. It's done. It's over. Your pain, what you're going through, your anguish, your stress, your frustrations, the hardness of life, the trials, the temptations, the failures, the waking up in the middle of the night, beating yourself up, feeling like a failure, thinking you're a failure, all these perceptions that are lies will be gone. Over. Those painful, gut-wrenching tears, gone. Jesus is going to wipe everyone from your eye. It's coming to an end. Where we live now, this environment, all of this is temporary. It is temporary. Paul says, when I was a child, I saw the world as a child sees it. But as I mature, I have a new perspective on the very same things. Well, this is a message of hope for you today. How many of you could remember childhood memories now that you're older, that you remember the memory the exact same way, but you have a different perspective on the memory? Yeah, that's awesome. Look at this. She's an adult in the child's body. I love it. Good for you. But it's interesting, right? I, I, I remember, I remember, actually, it's so funny, Vin, that actually you'd be sitting right there. I remember, so Vinny and I grew up together, 
right? We were the, we were the two Vinnies, which are the reason that my mom and dad turned gray uh, as quick as they did, all right? And, and so I remember when we were little and, and he would you know, sleep over the house on like, like a Friday night and we would just be like, can you take us to Blockbuster, please? Please take us to Blockbuster. We, we got to rent like the new Sega Genesis game or Nintendo game or whatever. And you're like, well, no, Vince, I don't really feel like going out and blah, blah, blah. Please, Ma, please, 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 please. You promised. You said you would. Please, please. Right? And we would beg and nag and plead. It was. <laughs> so, and, and eventually she'd give in, right? And she would take us. And then, of course, it was like, see, here's the thing. You, you younger guys with this whole, you know, Netflix, I click a button and, and it's on and I don't have to deal with commercials. Like, you don't understand. You're missing out. Going to Blockbuster, it wasn't just about picking the movie or the game and the snacks, you can't instant stream snacks, baby. That's it. You got to go to the store and buy those things. All right? It was all in one place. And we get there. And they had, they had the cotton candy that would turn into bubble gum. Right? You remember that? Oh, it was terrible for you. But of course I had to get it. And, right? and you'd have all the candy and just the, the nasty candy. It was just weird. Right? And just like super high sugar. Don't know how I don't have diabetes. Crazy, but we would stock up on that stuff and go up and down the aisles and have to look at it, right? And, and have to look at everything, even something we didn't. It was an experience. It was like walking around Disney World for a little kid, right? And you'd look at all the video games. And I know we're renting this one, but dude, we have to stay up all night and do what we can to beat this game so tomorrow we could come back and get that game. Like it, was, it was an experience, okay? <laughs> it was expensive, though. I mean, when you consider, so now you could, if you're, if you're um, I don't know, on Hulu or Vudu or, I don't know, Amazon, and you want to rent a movie, for the most part, you can rent a movie for what, $4.99? You have it instantaneously, and you get to keep it for three days, and I don't have to go back to the store and return it and get slapped on fees, right? Blockbuster, you were paying like five bucks a movie. This is way back when, five bucks a movie, and if you didn't bring it back, if it was a new release, you had two nights. If it wasn't, you had like five nights. And if you didn't bring it back in time, you paid $5 a day in penalties. What? <laughs> okay. Now, I'm a kid. All I thought about was the video game and the phone we were going to have and all the sugar and the candy. What I didn't realize was, yo, that just cost my parents a ton of money that they sacrificed for us to have a good time over the weekend. I had no idea. Now I have kids of my own. And they're like, oh, just put it on a car, Dad. I'm like, yeah, that's got to be paid for, kid. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You know? But here's the thing. When, when I was a child, I reasoned like a child. I thought like a child. All I thought about in that moment was me, what I wanted, my perspective. It was about me. I didn't care what it cost. I didn't know it cost. Right? Now, my parents loved me enough that they still did it for me. And they didn't, they didn't go, all right, kid, so this costs this much and this much and this much and this much. You're eventually going to need to find a way to pay that back when you're older. Like, we didn't have that conversation. So where, where, where am I going with this? Let me tell you how love works, all right? All of us kids in the room have no idea what our salvation actually really cost Jesus Christ. Amen. And he doesn't shove that in your face ever. Amen. In fact, he did that for you when you were his enemy. He did that from you when all you were thinking was me, 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 me. I got to get ahead. I just want more money. I just want more of this. I just want more of that. It's all about me. And he met you where you were at, even as a child. Powerful, right? And that's exciting. And unfortunately, my friends, that is where the typical church message ends. So now... We're going to pray, the band's going to come up, and we're going to have a small concert. Ah, but see, that's only half the story. See, that's the problem, is we don't just end it with this Christian consumerism. It's about me, and although I was jacked up and whatever, Jesus died on the cross for me. Paul says, yes, I was a child, and when I was a child, I thought like a child. I had a childish perspective. I saw the world as a child. But as I mature, I have a new perspective on the very same things. Well, this is a hope for you today. You need to grow up 
in the Lord. You need to mature spiritually. You need to take the time to see things for, for what he's doing, not just about you. Look, if my pain and my suffering and me battling depression and anxiety and me battling the different things that I deal with are going to benefit the body of Christ and glorify God, well then sign me up for that. Because it's not about me. It's about His glory. And I love Him more than I love me. Sometimes. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm a spoiled, rotten little kid saying, Daddy, take me to Blockbuster. Daddy, I don't want to do this anymore. I love the song Reckless Love that we did during worship. I love that bridge, man. I love that bridge. And that's, that's where I want to go. Some of you are going through things that right now are brutal and ugly and painful and don't seem to make sense. And when you get to heaven, you're going to have a very different perspective. Because right now we only see things from a limited perspective. But one day, you're going to see Jesus face to face. And Paul says something incredible here that rocks my theology. He says, we will know fully as we are known. All right. For my friends in the room who are also nerds like me, Check this out. If you're not a nerd, you can check out. That's fine. If you're a nerd, hang with me. You ready? <clears throat> the Greek word Paul uses here is the word gnosko. See, there's a bunch of Greek words that we translate with the word no in English. Okay? Whole lot of, whole lot of meanings of the word no. But in the Greek, in Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in, this word, there's different words for, for no. Because it's very specific, the Greek. Very specific. Some mean to know something and understanding. Another Greek word means to have a deep conviction from experience. Another means to diagnose or to use science, scientific method. But the word gnosko is special. The word gnosko is the same word used by the Virgin Mary when Gabriel said to her, you're going to give birth to the Messiah, and she responded, how can that be when I have not known any man? You don't know any men? I thought you were engaged to Joseph. Ah, no. No, that word known, that word known is a deep intimacy. A word we see biblically only used between a husband and a wife. Known. Adam knew his wife and they bore a child. Deep intimacy. A knowing that's beyond the mind. A tangling of spirit. That's the word. You will intimately, spiritually, like between a husband and a wife coming together for the first time, that intimately fully you will be fully nothing holding back no sin holding it back no lack of knowledge holding it back nothing holding back that deep gnosko intimacy with god Amen. you will know him fully as he knows you Amen. the epitome of relationship my friends with the very source of life. Jesus embodies the very definition of love in its true understanding here. And when we were his enemies, when we were far away from God, when we saw him as our enemy, he loved us anyway, and he loved us this way. This is the greater gift that Paul is referring to in chapter 12 from last week. The gifts like tongues and prophecy and administration and leadership, it's temporary for here and now. But the gifts that God has given all of us are faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of the three greatest gifts is love. So I just want to end today 
with some very clear practical application. This all sounds great in theory, right? So how do we bring this home? In fact, it's tempting to hear this and to see this and, and to look at everything Paul was talking about and, and to almost feel overwhelmed, like I will never achieve that, I will never be that. How's that, how's that possible? It could almost be a little defeating if you have unrealistic expectations on yourself. See, when Jesus was challenged with the question, what is the greatest law? By a Jewish lawyer, one of the Pharisees. Jesus responded, well, the greatest law is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your, your soul and your mind and your strength. And the second greatest law is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So how do we become better, better Christians, better people, better humans? It is not by behavior modification. It is not by following a multi-stepped program. It's not even, and this is, this is dangerous if you take me out of context. So please listen very carefully. It is not training on how to sin less. It is not training on how to sin less. There is not some special recipe or set of rules and regulations or things to abstain from. It is deeply and intimately spending more time and loving God more. If you love him, you will love his word. You will love prayer. You will love his church. You will love lost people. You will love your enemies. You will hate sin because it separates you from God who you love more than anything and anyone else in the world. And what I'm telling you is this. For years, the church has said, okay, well, you need to sin less. And if you sin, you need to do this, this, and this to, you know, make penance or whatever, okay? And, and what I'm telling you is this is biblically, it's just, it's not true. It's true in theory. It's true in theory. Like, we, we all agree, we should sin less, right? That'd be great, <laughs> right? No? We're all on the same page there? Okay. The formula for us achieving sinning less is not through self-actualization. It's not through continually talking about how wicked sin is and these are the steps that we need to follow in order to do this less, right? It's, it's not about that. Here's the thing. Jesus didn't come to change your behavior. He came and gave you a new heart. And the more you spend time with him, the more you love him, the more you naturally, without any special training required, will sin less. It's, it's, it's like the guy who, who, you know, was hanging out with a ton of different women in all these romantic comedies, right? He was, he was the guy every woman wanted, and he had like, you know, 15 different women on his arm all the time. But then he meets that one girl in, in the movie, right? And he falls for her, right? Kind of like, like a Cinderella story, right? Okay? Well, not that specifically, right? Prince Charming wasn't exactly a playboy. That's not what I'm getting at, right? But, but I'm saying, in these, in these romantic comedies, where the guy is, he's all over the place and he could have any girl he wants and they all catch his eye and his attention, right? And then, then he meets that, the one, the main character in, in, in the movie, right? And she's special. And then, you know, it's all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she didn't have to say, you need to stop looking at those other girls. No, he just focused on her. Suddenly, no one else looked that good anymore. No one had to train him. No one had to teach him that. It came quite natural. The overarching theme that I struggle with, that I see in the church today, is exactly what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Oh, you guys are doing a great job with theology. You guys are doing a great job taking care of the poor. Oh, there's just one thing I have against you. You've lost your first love. You've lost your motivation. It's me. I don't care how many love letters you write. I don't care what you do in my name. 
it's nothing if you're not in love with me. Church, my friends, my brothers and sisters, fall deeply and intimately. Gnosko him intimately. Study his word for yourself. Please, I pray this is not the only day of the week that you are intimately involved with him. I pray that when Kyle's up here strumming and we're singing, that it's not just emotional karaoke, but that you are singing love songs to the lover of your soul. I pray that you do that at home. I pray you embarrass yourself on the LIE sitting in traffic because you're blasting the worship music and you're singing to him, even though everybody around you thinks you're nuts, right? I I pray that you are spending so much time in the word and in prayer that you're accidentally late to work every once in a while because you just get caught in a moment. Because here's something I'll guarantee you. I guarantee it. Bet the mortgage, folks. I guarantee it. The more you fall in love with him, the less struggle you will find with sin. You want the cure to get past that addiction? You want the cure to get past that thing? (laughs) Find someone worthy of more of your attention than that thing and be all in. Give them all you got. And you will naturally love his people because that's who he loves. And you will naturally find yourself wanting to gather more with them. And see, here's the thing. We could, we could be tempted to do the, the, the gather at church. Um, <laughs> we, we could be here. Kyle, you could have this one. Uh, we, we could be tempted to do the whole gather at church thing and um, you know, do everything that, that we can to get more people thing. You know, I mean, we could... We could we could raffle stuff off so that people come to church and, and you know, I could, I could be a little less honest and a little bit more entertaining, mm-hmm. right? I hear the sweet spot today is like 30 minutes, so if I preach more than 30 minutes, like people aren't coming. And, um, hi Siri. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? And so we could, we could do all that stuff, right? We could, we, could, we could fill a room. We could entertain people. We can give stuff away and get a lot more bagels and, and uh, more coffee. And, and hey, I mean, we could... We could actually put out an even bigger spread and throw like these parties here to, to get people to come, right? And we, could, we could manipulate people into this place all day. Come on, we know how to draw a crowd. Drawing a crowd isn't hard. I do marketing for a living. I could draw a crowd. Is that our goal? No, see, here's the thing. My desire is that you desire to come together, and I don't even care if it's here, okay? (laughs) It doesn't matter. My desire is that your desire is to come together and love one another and spend time with one another and encourage one another to empower each other to go and use your gifts to go after people that are far from God so that they would fall in love with Jesus and so that they would then want to grow in their relationship with Jesus and they will naturally and organically want to come here and want to be a part of this family and want to show up. Why? Because they want to. Here's what I'm getting at. I I would rather have an empty room because the few people in it want desperately to pursue the lover of their soul than have to manipulate or find other motivations to fill a room. Mm -hmm. And so, so what, you know, what's our strategy? What's our strategy to get Park Center Community Church to grow? We're going to love people as much as we can like that, not by forcing it, but by loving Jesus more so that through him we're set free of sin and we love people more and we disciple them through relationship and we build relationships with them. And if they want to come here, they're welcome. And if they want to go to a different church, we'll plug them in and we'll introduce them to those people. 
And that's our strategy. Our strategy is to grow God's kingdom, not ours. Amen. That's our strategy. That's our strategy. That's it in a nutshell. I love you guys. And let me be really clear. <laughs> and and, I've, and I've, I know you guys, so like, I like you, right? But I love you guys because Jesus is so head over heels in love with you, and I love him so much that I love what he loves, and I love who he loves. And I'm telling you, you, you are his creation. You are his beloved. You are his chosen. You are the ones that he gave his life for. And so how dare I not give you the dignity, the respect, and the love and adoration and admiration that he has for you? Amen. Let's love each other that way. And here's, here's the cool thing, and I'll, and I'll end with this, and I'll, I'll let Kyle come do his thing. Here's, here's the really cool thing, is if we look at this and if we consider what I just said there, check this out. Jesus said to his disciples, a couple of sentences before the Great Commission as he was about to take off. Do you know how they're going to know that you guys are my disciples? See, there's a litmus test. It's not because you say the right things. It's not because you give to the poor. It's not because you memorize everything I told you. That's not it. That's not it. They are going to know you're my disciples by how you love Really? Yeah. Yeah. By how you love. That's how they're going to know. That's the standard. Period. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you so much. But we love you because you loved us first. We love you because you are all in in our lives. How can we not be all in with you, God? God, set our hearts on fire. That our love for you would deepen. That, that we would gnosko you. That we would know you so deeply and intimately. That it would drive us to love who you love more deeply. God, that, that we would be so motivated to go after people that are far from you because you changed our hearts. God, that we would, we would be driven. God, that we wouldn't be weary and that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be entitled and we wouldn't get so irritable, but that we would be driven by love. God, give us patience and kindness God, don't let us become envious of one another's gifts, but let us recognize each gift is of the same value to you as Paul just talked about last week, God. Father, strengthen our hearts that we wouldn't grow weary, but that we would stay so focused on you that all temptation, all sin, all idolatry, everything that gets in the way that we can't even see it anymore because we're so laser focused on you. I, I, I remember my wedding day when I was standing up at the altar and paying the bill. I know there were a ton of people there. when those double doors opened and my bride-to-be took that first step, I had no idea anybody else was even there. God, may that be our intimacy and our relationship that we would never grow cold of that day, that that, that, that would never wear off but that it would only go deeper and stronger and drive harder. And that as we navigate through this crazy life, through the ups and downs, through the hard stuff and the fun stuff, that the whole time my eyes are fixed on you, our eyes are fixed on yours. That Peter walked on water when his eyes were fixed on you, but it's when he looked away that he saw. So God, call us all out of the boat. 
Call us to do the impossible and keep our eyes fixed on you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.